Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everybody uh, who's joining us from around the world. It's great to see everybody logging on and saying hello from everywhere. Fantastic to have you all joining us today for this Biogal webinar, a Leptosuspect, a disease overview and management review. My name is Jessica Case. I am the manager of Complete Veterinary Care. We are proud to be the UK distributors for Biogal. And uh, it's, it's fantastic to be able to welcome uh, Dr. Robert Armentano to present the webinar today. Uh, before we begin, uh, it's great to let everybody know that there are three live translations available for today's webinar. We have Spanish, Portuguese, and Turkish live translations available. You should be able to see an option uh, to be able to uh, access those uh, on your Zoom menu. Uh, so please feel free to, to join in with that and uh, that will be translated live throughout the presentation. We will be having a question and answer session at the end of today's webinar. Uh, for all questions, please could we ask that you use the Q&A button that you will see in your menu. Uh, use the Q&A uh, rather than the chat option uh, to make sure that your question is noted. Uh, Dr. Armentano will be going through some questions at the end of the webinar. But uh, for all of those that he's not able to get to today, they will be noted and he will be answering them at a later date and the answers to these questions will be sent along with the recording of today's webinar. So please don't worry if your question isn't answered live today, it will be answered and you will get that information along with the recording of the webinar today. Uh, one more reminder that there is Turkish, Portuguese and Spanish live translations available, so you can uh, join in with that. So please use the Q&A button for all of your questions. Uh, and as I can see that everyone is joining in and getting comfortable, uh, I will uh, give you some information about Dr. Robert, who will be presenting today. Dr. Robert Armentano is, a board, certi is board certified in small animal internal medicine. He is a Chicago native and did his undergraduate studies in animal sciences at the University of Illinois. He stayed at the University of Illinois, having obtained early admission into the veterinary school and completed his training there. After his DVM degree, he continued his training at the University of Florida for a rotating internship and internal medicine res residency. Dr. Armentano has engaged in many speaking opportunities, including Chicago news updates on emerging infectious diseases, such as, such as blastomycosis, leptospirosis, and canine influenza. He has participated in prospective research projects, published book chapters, and is actively participating in ongoing research. Dr. Armentano currently works at the Veterinary Speciality Center in the Chicagoland area. He lives with his wife, son, and dog, in his spare time, he enjoys travel, the Chicago Cubs, Go Cubbies, and endurance sports, including marathons and triathlons. Today's webinar is the Lepto Suspect, a disease overview and management review. This webinar will review the clinical approach to patients that may have leptospirosis, emphasizing early detection due to disease virulence and zoonotic potential. We will also review the diagnostic tests available, including Biogal's test and treatment recommendations based off of evidence-based medicine. Fantastic to have you all joining in and all saying hello in the chat. Please put all questions in the Q&A box. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Armentano. Great, thank you very much. So as discussed, today we're going to talk about the lepto suspect. Leptospirosis is a very common disease found throughout the world in dogs. And due to the zoonotic potential, leptospirosis should be a differential diagnosis for any patient presenting with mainly acute, but also chronic renal and hepatic, as well as fever of unknown origins and vascular disease. Today, I'm gonna to focus on the pathogenesis and clinical presentations of the disease. We will focus on subtle changes on blood work that should hopefully help increase the suspicions of leptospirosis in a clinical patient. Since lepto is a zoonotic disease, for the public health and safety to owners, 
staff and other pets in the house, it's very important to quickly assess the lepto suspect to not only test, but to treat and take precautions in a hospital setting. We'll then briefly go over treatment, prevention, and vaccinations. There are also some really good resources, as on the last slide, um, in regards to the consensus statements as a really nice in-depth review of leptospirosis. Leptospirosis is a zoonotic bacteria, which makes this topic so important. It's a thin, motile spirochete bacteria, and there's over 250 pathogenic serovars. A serovar is essentially a subspecies of the organism. So although on a clinical day-to-day -day basis, the serovar is not very important with how we're going to treat these animals, it is important that your test is detecting that serovar. It also does vary a little bit of how that serovar will present clinically. So I won't go throughout all of them because they're different throughout the world, um, but Again, when we're testing them, it is important to be inclusive for them. When we're treating them, it doesn't matter as much. The general risk factors for leptospirosis includes exposure to outdoor wildlife. They are the harboring host. The reservoir hosts include rats, pigs, horses, mice, skunk, possums, voles, and raccoons. The disease is often more prevalent in male dogs. Geographically, it happens to affect in more wet and damp environments, which is where I live. As you can see, this is a PCR geographic map from just a few years ago, and I live in the red dot. And so we see lots and lots of leptospirosis, which is why we have so much clinical experience. It lives in viable soil for many weeks, but even months in the environment. We definitely see it throughout the winter time, but a lot less likely. It's overall considered year round. In the United States, we tend to see it a little bit more in the fall, just because that's when it's wetter. The general risk factors include signalment. So we talked about male dogs being more predisposed and the ages are just generally the more active dogs that are outside. So between two and about 10 years old. The one thing that was always a previous misnomer or um, not commonly utilized when we were talking about vaccinating these dogs is we used to think about the large breed dogs that are out in the environment hunting and doing other activities. More recent studies because of the endemic roles of mice, et cetera, in city environments and that leptospirosis is everywhere, it is seen also very commonly in small breed dogs. So when we're talking about patients that should be vaccinated, we might wanna be considering essentially all dogs if you live in an endemic region. So just as a general schematic, when going over the disease process, there is a maintenance host, as we can see here, which are the asymptomatic patients that we talked about. It can be transmitted to cats. Cats are very resistant from getting clinical leptospirosis. There are some wild animals, including dogs, that can be reservoir hosts. But for the most part, it is transmitted to the soil and water surfaces. And then dogs are licking their paws or drinking from the water, and they're getting it that way. So the general pathogenesis is we'll see that they're ingesting or getting exposure to leptospirosis through their mucous membranes. The incubation is quite quick. So within one to seven days, it starts to have a clinical effect if it's going to. It causes vascular damage and spread to internal organs. One of the main inciting factors that causes clinical disease is an outer membrane leptospiral LPS which is called LIPL32. What that protein does is it stimulates a tremendous inflammatory response, triggering IL-1 and TNF-alpha. Also importantly, it inhibits the sodium potassium ATPase in the renal tubules. That will be important when we're looking at the clinical presentation and how it's affecting dogs' kidneys. It can also cause a tremendous vasculitis and platelet aggregation. So one of the other things that we will commonly see is platelet aggregation. So this is a schematic that just kind of goes through the clinical presentation depending on the patient's immune status. 
as we can see over in this corner here is if we have a very high antibody titer, likely from recent vaccination, we should not hopefully see a big effect in clinical signs. If they have a moderate antibody titer, they may temporarily shed the organism, hopefully kill it off themselves, and then have no further shedding. The cases that are gonna end up on the clinical setting is the naive animals that don't have any antibody titer, which it's going to then affect the main target organs, which is the kidney, liver, and causing coagulopathies. Hopefully we are doing a good job and preventing this step here, which is death, because we obviously want to make all these animals better. As we will talk about later, it can sometimes cause a chronic active inflammatory disease in the liver and the kidney. And then our ultimate goal is to have the animal clear the organism and hopefully have no more shedding. And that is the importance of us diagnosing this disease quickly, treating it so they do not shed it further in the environment. The typical or usual lepto suspects mainly include dogs that are coming in with just generalized not feeling well. Some of them are drinking more and urinating more. Some of them are just sick. So they're showing signs of vomiting, diarrhea, anorexia, and sometimes abdominal discomfort. The main part of the diagnosis is gonna come from our initial blood testing. 30 to 50% of dogs will present with acute renal failure. Up to 10 to 20% of dogs will present with only hepatic failure. Interestingly, in the area that I live, our vaccinations tend to be quite good, but sometimes we see that the vaccinations are very reno protective, but sometimes we'll see them present with only the liver manifestations, meaning it might not be covering all of the CRVRs that are affecting the liver, but overall, um, and so those are the patients that may present with one or the other. The very clinical diagnosis where it's easy to diagnose this disease is where they are presenting for both liver and kidney disease, and that is in 25 to 35% of the animals. Because if we see clinically, there are not a lot of diseases that cause both kidney and liver injury. Most of the time it's one or the other. Again, rarely toxins affect both of those. So we think of other atypical infectious organisms or cancers, lymphoma can certainly affect both organ systems too. Some of the other more challenging cases are the dogs that just prevent, present with mild fevers, and that could be up to five to 10% of them. Acute re renal failure, or more appropriately termed acute kidney injury, happens in a majority and probably the most common clinical sign that we'll see. It does this by causing an interstitial nephritis, renal swelling and vasculitis, which then is decreasing the dog's GFR. It does this by colonizing the renal tubular cells, causing electrolyte disturbances. And interestingly, because that leptospiral endotoxin inhibits the sodium and potassium ATPase, we often will see a hyponatremia and hypokalemia. The interesting part with that is most acute kidney injuries in dogs, they come in hyperkalemic. So in patients that come in with low potassiums, that's one other thing that nudges leptospirosis up just a little bit on my list. In dogs that present with acute hepatic failure, plus or minus that kidney component, and again, certain studies would say 14%, sometimes I think it's even higher, we will often see an increase, of course, in their liver enzymes and bilirubin. Um, interestingly, most of the time we think of acute liver injury causing a high ALT over an ALP. Interesting with leptospirosis, it tends to cause a cholestasis of sepsis, which causes acute liver swelling. So we'll often see that the ALP is much higher than the ALT and the bilirubin values can often climb. In dogs that tend to have a renal component as well, we tend to see their kidney component start to improve as we're treating them. And then a lot of times that liver swelling will persist and go on for a while, sometimes days to weeks after we're managing them, which often resolves on its own. When talking about more of the usual or depending your endemic region, unusual lepto suspects, 
Leptospiral pulmonary hemorrhage system is more of a unique syndrome that happens with different serovars, much more commonly in European cases. In my evaluation, we don't see it as much in the United States. What it's doing is causing a caudal dorsal lung distribution in the lungs. It's caused by fibrosis, vasculitis, and thromboemboli. So interestingly, where in the liver, in the kidney, it's the actual organism that is affecting or destroying that organ. In the lung, it's more of a secondary inflammatory response and caused by an immune stimulation. There are some direct leptospiral effects in the lungs as well. One study saw that up to 43% of cases, and that was a US-based study, saw that it can affect the lungs. Most of those patients did not become very clinical. In a, some serovars, particularly in Europe, there can be it, where it is a very large clinical problem, which does make some treatments more challenging, especially when we're talking about kidney replacement therapy and needing to consider blood thinners for them. And as, unfortunately, there is an increased mortality rate associated with this leptospiral hemorrhage syndrome. Some of the other unusual lepto suspects include dogs that present with just severe PUPD, and that's likely due to a decrease of the GFR without azotemia. So it's affecting the kidney function, but not enough to cause the blood work values to become abnormal. There's also a thought that those toxins that it's producing can cause a form of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, making the collecting ducts resistant to vasopressin. Another manifestation of the disease is chronic kidney disease. Um, this is a South American study that evaluated dogs with chronic kidney disease, showing increased titers of both MAT and urine PCR. So we'll talk about the importance of that later, but would be much more suggestive that these dogs actively are shedding and carrying leptospirosis. A part of the syndrome we can also see is hemorrhage due to vasculitis, causing petechial hemorrhages, epistaxis, melana, and hematemesis. We also often will see an associated thrombocytopenia as well. Some of the other unusual suspects can present with a chronic hepatitis. So chronically increased liver enzymes with animals not being acutely ill. On biopsy, this is mostly diagnosed as a granulomatous hepatitis. This is a smaller study, but what they looked at is evaluating PCR on liver tissue itself and doing a special stain that's called FISH testing, which stands for fluorescent in situ hybridization. You can see in this picture here, these little red dots are the organisms that are being picked up on the stain. Very interestingly, there are certain serovars that seem to be more likely to do this, and it seems to be more of a localized infection in the liver because a lot of these animals are not showing up positive on the serologic testing meaning that they're not mounting a tremendous immune response, it's just hiding in that liver tissue. The even more unusual lepto suspects are dogs that present with intestinal intussusceptions. Most of the time, this is thought to be due to a secondary vasculitis and GI inflammation. It can happen concurrently with azotemia, in the dogs that I've seen, all of them have had severe azotemia and then also happen to have GI components and, be, and are diagnosed with an intussusception. Cardiac disturbances are also known. Normally, I don't see this as a big clinical problem, but it is something to look out for. Next is the general clinical pathology of these suspects. So most of the things are fairly intuitive. We're gonna see increases in kidney values of the BUN and creatinine, increases in the liver enzymes. And as we had talked about, because of that sodium potassium ATPase change, we can often see decreases in sodium and potassium. The CBCs are often not very helpful in helping dif distinguish a leptospirosis candidate. One of the things is thrombocytopenia. Again, most acid, acute kidney injuries don't cause low platelets. So that's another thing, if I see it, will nudge up lepto a little bit higher on my list. When looking at the urinalysis, 
things like proteinuria, hematuria, and pyuria are often seen, again, in many patients that have acute kidney injury. The one that always stands out more prominently is the glucosuria. There's not a lot of kidney injury diseases that cause glucosuria. So when I see that as well, and that's because of that tubular colonization of the organism that makes leptospirosis go a little bit higher on my list. So breaking down, this is just a study that looked up lepto cases. I won't go through all of these statistics, but as we can see the percentage column here, majority of these animals are presenting with azotemia and increased liver enzymes, which is intuitive. Some of these animals also interestingly are presenting with hypoalbuminemias, likely due to the vasculitis component. And then again, as we had talked about, thrombocytopenia is something that is very interesting and makes them nudge a little bit higher on my list. As you could see here in the uh, median range, they can go very, very low. In my clinical experience though, they typically are in the lower end of the normalish reference range. So 100s, 150,000 platelets per micro microliter are more commonly seen. It seems to be fairly rare where we're seeing the 2000s, 5000 range. When looking at our thoracic radiographs, if they are gonna have the component of that leptospiral hemorrhage syndrome, we often will see a caudodorsal interstitial lung pattern that can look similarly to a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, edema. And again, some of these patients are clinical and some of them are not. It is only treated with supportive care. When looking at abdominal ultrasound, oftentimes it is fairly nonspecific. We could see mild liver and spleen changes. We're using an ultrasound mainly to rule out other diseases. When looking at the kidney, we will often see renomegaly because of that inflammatory response. We can sometimes see a little bit more classic kidney changes suggestive of leptospirosis which would include this medullary rim sign due to the increased cortical echogenicity. Also another very classic thing that we will see is this perirenal fluid. And that's again from the vasculitis and acute swelling of the kidney. When talking about testing our lepto suspects, this is a very important thing to evaluate because we want a very early diagnosis and keep up with being able to diagnose this disease as early as possible. The traditional methods include culture. Overall, this is a very non-insensitive test with a long turnaround time, so is often not recommended. As we had talked about with liver sampling, sometimes we can do direct identification but that is also not utilized very routinely. The main thing that we're gonna be looking into is serology, which is MAT testing, as well as the newer and more available rapid diagnostic tests, including ELISA and lateral flow testing. And then even more kind of advanced or getting potentially an early turnaround time is PCR testing. There's both availabilities to first send out PCR testing at your local veterinary diagnostic lab. And then we'll also talk about BioGals um, testing, which is called PC run. So once again, direct identification has a lot of limitations. So really in a practical day-to-day -day setting, this is not gonna be something we're gonna be utilizing. And again, fluorescent antibodies, that is something that's often on histopathology. Hopefully we are not needing to do biopsies on these patients, especially in the acute setting. So this is a general schematic of how serology and PCR testing works in a leptospirosis patient. We can see over here, this is a positive result. This is when they are presenting with clinical disease and then time of infection. When you are acutely exposed to leptospirosis, there is a sudden increase in your blood DNA of the organism. So that would be detected on PCR testing. Then these patients stop shedding it there in their blood. It sequesters into the kidneys, and then they are going to be urine PCR positive. And some of these patients will stay persistently positive if they are a chronic shedder or not appropriately treated. In this curve here, we have them going back to zero because hopefully we effectively diagnosed and treated the condition.
The other important evaluation on these curves here is there is this delay in serology, which is MAT testing and other rapid diagnostic tests. The, so the serology is measuring an antibody. So it takes time for your body to mount that immune response to then be able to notice it on a test. And we'll talk about those tests later. So when talking about PCR testing, that is a direct extraction of DNA from the blood or the urine. It is very useful if they are actively shedding the disease, but as you can imagine, based off the last schematic, there are some limitations. If they're no longer shedding it in that area you're sampling, you're going to get a negative result. The infection days for blood is about day one through 10. So obviously this is when they're presenting very acutely. The sensitivity of blood testing is quite high within the first five days, but then it rapidly decreases to 50% and will go to negative normally by day 10 once it's sequestered within those other organs. So again, getting a very appropriate history is gonna be important to find out where you think your patient is shedding a lot of times it's thought that blood testing is not as helpful because most animals are not finally making it to a veterinarian within those immediate windows, right? Normally people are monitoring their dog for a day or two while they're getting ill. And so oftentimes by the time they're seeing a veterinarian, it's past that day five window, but not always. After day 10, urine PCR is thought to be much more helpful. And again, theoretically, especially if the kidneys are affected, they are going to be chronically then shedding in the urine unless they're going to clear it themselves or until we treat them and get the organism out of their system. Of course, if it's unknown, it's the best recommendation to do both. The limitations of this test include normally there's a delayed turnaround time that we'll talk about if they are not actively shedding right? If you're sampling the blood, but it's not in the blood at the time, you're not going to get a positive result. If you administer antimicrobials, there is a limitation of the test there too, because you're physically killing off the organism. So then if it's not in the sample you obtained because the organism is gone now, you're going to get a negative result. The other limitation is in regards to especially urine sampling is gonna be having very diluted urine samples. Because these animals are drinking and urinating so much because they have an acute kidney injury, their urine is very dilute. The other limitation is a lot of times our intuitive reaction is to give these animals under the skin fluids or IV fluids. The administration of those fluids prior to getting a sample could give you a false negative result. So our standard PCR testing, which again is where we're collecting samples of blood and urine, sending it to our normal veterinary diagnostic lab, and our turnaround time is about three to five days. So that is one of the bigger limitations. It also requires highly specialized equipment and technical staff in order to do that. And so the limitation is, of course, not getting the information back in the time that we need to know if we have a lepto suspect or not. So we're often treating them empirically. BioGall has a very interesting test and it seems to be um, changing the way we think about PCR testing. BioGall has a test that's called PC Run, which is literally an in-hospital machine that allows us to extract DNA and run leptospiral samples PCR testing right then in the hospital. So it's simple. Um, it doesn't require a lot of technical training for it. The machine is small and portable, and there's a very quick turnaround time. Once it's in the machine, it only takes about an hour to get results. So if you're in an area where this is an approved testing to use, it really does change a lot of the story because if you can get a positive PCR sample, you know they have DNA in, the, or in their body right then at that time and essentially have diagnosed them with leptospirosis. So again, this test is a point of care test using, uh, it's an isothermal PCR assay. 
And you do get a true like positive or negative sign on the machine to make it very clear. You also can get an analysis of how much or organism it is detecting. And what it's doing is di detecting primers directed at the hemolysis associated protein, HAPL encoding gene, which is a protein that is expressed in pathogenic leptospires, but not saprophytic isolates. Saprophytic meaning normal bugs and bacteria that live in the environment. Obviously, we don't want to be getting false positives in, in, in organisms that aren't not leptospirosis. Overall, this test has been shown to have a high sensitivity and specificity compared to other local machines and outside PCR testing. It can detect 34 plus pathogenic serovars, and there's no cross-reaction again with other random bacteria that would be causing a different in urinary tract infection, for example. So the next type of testing is MAT testing. This stands for microscopic agglutination testing, which detects both IgG and IgM antibodies. Again, I won't go through all of the serovars in each individual lab in your endemic region will have their own set of cultures that they are using for their serovars in your local region which does pose a little bit of limitations because literally every laboratory is a little bit different on what samples and what um, serovars they're going to pick up. In general, you're gonna get a quantitative number back that's gonna give you a value of how much of antibody they have mounted to that particular serovar. In general, a single titer of one to 800 in a non-vaccinated dog would be considered diagnostic for leptospirosis. And as we can see here, that has some variable sensitivity and specificity. This test also is measuring those IgG antibodies that a vaccine will produce. So there is overlap in both true infection and vaccinated patients. So it's often thought that you need a higher titer to prove you have a leptospirosis infection. So a single titer of one to 1600 in a vaccinated dog is considered diagnostic. We will talk about in the next few slides how there is some variability with that. In general, the highest serovar does not correlate with the infective serovar. Well, there is a lot of what's called paradoxical reactions and cross reactivity, which is good in the sense that you're maybe even picking up serovars that are not written on that line. The disadvantage is that you're not gonna know exactly what infective serovar necessarily that patient has. But although clinically, it's important that it's included in the test on the clinical patient when we're talking about treatment, it doesn't matter. And actually each lab is so different. In one study, they sent the same MAT testing to five different laboratories and there was only agreement at 31% of the time as to which one was the effective serovar because of that paradoxical reaction. So oftentimes, with these different lab variabilities, as well as the complications associated with vaccination, many patients need what's called a convalescent titer to prove they have leptospirosis. So we do our baseline sample. It either fits those initial criteria that we just talked about to say, I really think this dog has lepto. However, if you have a negative result or not a high enough titer, what we do is retest that MAT about two to four weeks later, but as soon as one week later, and you're looking for a fourfold increase in titer to prove that they have the infection. And actually in one of the larger leptospirosis studies, they needed a convalescent titer 45% of the time to prove they actually had the infection. So again, if you're getting a negative MAT, we don't wanna discount that they don't have lepto. We may need to do that follow-up test and of course be treating in the meantime if we really think that they have leptospirosis. Although a PCR test will be affected by antibiotic therapy, an MAT will not. So you can treat them and still test them later and you will still get that immune response you're looking for. <clears throat> 
This study was very interesting in which they looked at vaccine associated antibodies. So these are dogs that did not have leptospirosis. They were vaccinated and they monitored their MAT. And this testing proved some very impressive results. We can see at about the month mark, these dogs are still mounting an, an IgG IgM response up to one to 1600 or greater. We can see here, this is about the two month mark. We're still seeing titers well above one to 1600. And then almost at the four month mark, we're still seeing some patients with the one to 1600 and even at the one to 800 mark. So again, within that four month window, although the vaccines are very good at preventing the disease, they can still get lepto. It just makes this test very challenging to use because you're gonna see those high titers for a while from vaccination. It is also very important to note that you cannot use an MAT to monitor vaccinated dogs. Interestingly, and this is not fully understood, but the vaccine initially triggers this IgG response, which is measured on an MAT, and then it likely is stimulating more of an innate immune response later, because although these titers are going down, we know these animals are still protected and the vaccines are still working. So as we alluded to, but there are some limitations, of course, to an MAT test. There's that delayed turnaround time that we're needing to send that out to an outside lab. We often, about 50% of the time, need a convalescent titer. We have that vaccine overlap. There's some lab variability and disagreement depending on which lab you're sending to. So if you're gonna send a convalescent titer, it's best to send it back to the same lab the first one was sent to. And then again, it's possible, and this is not proven, but we, there's a suspicion that MAT positivity may depend on the level of actual agglutination on the test, which is looking for mature antibodies. And so since, it's trying to detect both of them, it may not detect the super early part of that disease, which is why there's a delay in that MAT response due to immaturity of antibodies. So next we'll talk about some of the cage side testing or rapid diagnostic tests. Immunocomb by Biogal, if available in your region, is a very nice cage side test. It is an antibody dot ELISA test that's looking for an IgG antibodies. It detects many serovars. It has a high correlation to the send out kind of gold standard MAT positive result. And it is one of the only rapid diagnostic tests that you can do in a hospital that you can monitor it increasing titer. Most of the tests are qualitative, meaning they're a yes, no test, whereas the immunocomb test, you can get levels of positivity to try to have a higher suspicion. It's often, it's a very easy test to run as well. And again, is done in the hospital setting. Immunocomb overall has a high sensitivity, which is great. It will get some cross-reactivity of many serovars, which is also very important. And there's been uh, different studies that have looked into its evaluation. Here we can see this is an MAT response of positive dogs and immunocomb essentially included all of those. So having that higher sensitivity, which is good. Other rapid diagnostic tests are available as well. Um, certain ones that are available in your endemic region because um, immunocomb is not routinely used in the United States, but would be nice if we could. And so there are other comparable tests that measure either an acute stage IgM or a more immune stage IgG. And these again are cage sized tests. The IgM-based test has been shown was a little bit able to detect earlier leptospirosis than in the MAT, so allowing that early diagnosis is important. The immune stage may have a higher sensitivity, but a little bit lower specificity than the other tests. So again, we always want to be, have a very inclusive test, but overall just important to know that there are various rapid diagnostic tests that are available in your local region. 
So we'll go through this schematic of how this all encompasses together. So here we have a leptospirosis suspect based off our history, our blood work is consistent with lepto. And the one more important part before we go through the whole schematic is kind of the cool importance with having the availability of PC run is that if you have a PC run sample available, you're doing it on blood and urine and it's positive, really the exploration is over and you have a lepto positive patient. Since though, there is some limitation of PCR, meaning they might not be shedding at the time. If it's negative, we then have to go through the further schematic. So we'll start with a non-vaccinated dog. If you have a non-vaccinated dog and you perform a rapid diagnostic test in the hospital and you get a strong positive, that patient has leptospirosis. If you get a weak positive, you would say it's presumptive, but it is still recommended then to send out a confirmatory test, which is either a convalescent MAT or sending out urine PCR to prove it. If we have a vaccinated dog that's greater than four months of vaccination, and again, that four month window is because of how much dogs can mount an immune response in that first four month window after a vaccine. So in those patients, if you have a rapid diagnostic test that's positive, we're gonna say they have presumptive leptospirosis, but just because there are some of those outliers of dogs that can have a positive titer, because again, these rapid diagnostic tests are kind of mentally thought to be similar to an MAT. They're just cage side and more qualitative. We're gonna say they have presumptive leptospirosis, but you're still gonna to wanna to send out your confirmatory tests, but they aid in the ability for you now being able to say, this is a high leptospirosis suspect, and we wanna know that we, so we can take the precautions. If we have a negative test, again, because it just may not have been long enough that they may have not mounted that immune response, you're going to want to continue further investigation with the tests we've talked about, trying to see if we can get a positive. But if you get negative results there, of course, we have to be looking for something else. If you have a vaccinated dog that's prior to the four-month window, again, the serology and rapid diagnostic tests are quite limited because they're likely going to be positive due to that immune response from the vaccine. Also, hopefully it's a little bit less likely they have lepto just in general because of their recent vaccination. And we're gonna need to send out PCR testing to see if we can prove they have the organism in their body. And certainly you would need a convalescent titer. Again, in a month's window, if you have a dog that is actively has lepto, you're gonna expect an increase in that titer by fourfold. Whereas we saw in that diagram of dogs that are vaccinated, over time, their titers will come down. So if they're going up, they have lepto. If they're going down and up by the fourfold, if they're going down, it's likely their vaccine. So further investigation, of course, into which test is going to be the best combination is important. We are currently doing some evaluation comparing rapid ELISA's, MAT, urine PCR, and doing PC run samples on both blood and urine on our lepto suspect patients. And interestingly, and it may be just in the region we're in, is we're seeing a very high utility of PC run in regards to blood samples in uh, achieving that early diagnosis. And we're also seeing a correlation and a strong correlation with rapid ELISA testing and PCR tests. And hopefully there will be more to come on that. So next, we will briefly go over treatments and antimicrobial therapies. Doxycycline is the mainstay therapy recommended to treat leptospirosis with dosing of five milligrams per kilogram PO or IV for two weeks. In our patients that are sick in the hospital that will not tolerate doxycycline because it often can cause GI upset, we will often use a penicillin-derived drug such as ampicillin, or we use Unison, which is ampicillin with Sylbactam. And use, but normally the penicillin derived drugs are not good enough at fully clearing the organism. So in order to clear that full shedding state that's in the kidneys, they still need doxycycline. 
And oftentimes, at least in rat models, after antimicrobials are administered and they are going to be responsive to that antibiotic and not a resistant leptospire, normally after about three to four days post antimicrobial therapy, they should not be shedding in their urine anymore. Other antimicrobials, if they won't tolerate or if you don't have availability of the others, is enrofloxacin. Um, there was a very nice study that showed that dogs that got enrofloxacin after a period of treatment, they did show that they will show up PCR negative and it was able to clear the organism. Of course, depending on how sick the patient is, they need supportive care. So aggressive IV fluid therapy. In our hospitalized patients, we put urinary catheters in all of those dogs measuring ins and outs and for zoonotic safety. In order to prevent oliguria and anuria, we're sometimes using Lasix CRIs or diltiazin CRIs as a calcium channel blocker to help open up that blood supply to the kidneys. But for the most part, we're using aggressive fluid therapy to make sure these patients are appropriately hydrated while using antimicrobial therapies. Dialysis or renal replacement therapies are obviously ideally avoided, but very interestingly, although renal replacement therapy is always thought to be a very big extreme in our veterinary patients. Interestingly, leptospirosis is very res uh, responsive to renal replacement therapy. In one evaluation, about 80% of dogs that would have been deemed to have passed away from lepto because they were becoming aneuric, et cetera, responded to dialysis and did quite well. And typically, they need a shorter amount of dialysis sessions than other patients with acute kidney injuries, normally only one to three sessions, sometimes a little bit longer. And indications for renal replacement therapies includes oliguria or anuria, particularly with volume overload. Overhydrating these patients can be almost just as detrimental as underhydrating them. If they have severe electrolyte disturbances, severe azotemia, or they're just non-medically responsive to our treatments, they could be a renal replacement candidate. And interestingly, we used to always think that doxycycline treated all of these patients, and there's been some more recent studies to show these resistant leptospires. In one study, they showed that 63% of dogs within 14 days of antimicrobial therapy were negative on their urine PCR which is overall a good number. However, that means that 38 plus percent of them were showing persistent positive titers after at least just traditional doxycycline therapy. So some animals do require additional antimicrobials. As we can see in this diagram here, this is their follow-up and the number of dogs and the days they had to be followed up. The black boxes are just doxycycline alone, but some animals based off their PCR stat status either needed combinations of penicillin derived drugs and doxycycline, enrofloxacin, or another antimicrobial that has showed really good promise is clarithromycin with clearing that um, deeper tissue within the kidney. So the general recommendation is that if you have a PCR positive dog, you should be retesting them seven days after treatment, again, to make sure that they're clearing the organism and no longer shedding it in the environment. Overall, the prognosis is quite good for leptospirosis if we can diagnose it early and get them treated. About 80% recovery in most patients. If they develop the respiratory signs, their prognosis is considered poorer. And overall, and this goes for kind of any acute kidney injury, we'll often see an improvement within about 14 days of treatment. But most acute kidney injuries, it takes three to four weeks for your kidneys to fully remodel and have a better baseline as to where they're going to end up. And then, of course, there's the precautions for the zoonotic concerns. So the incubation in people is between two and 25 days. So if they're sick, we basically want to have them consult with a, uh, their physician. In hospital, we want to use common precautions, such as gowns and gloves, indwelling urinary catheters, and it is killed frequently with bleach, so we can kill it that way. Because normally they're not shedding after about three to four days, owners have to take less precautions once they've been hospitalized. But using common sense, since it's only shed in the urine, 
if handling urine, wearing gloves, making sure it's not splashing in your eyes. And currently the ACBIM criteria does recommend treating other patients in the hospital or in the house, excuse me, or at least testing them if another dog in the house has lepto. Overall, vaccines are obviously very effective and recommended in endemic regions. There are different vaccines in your local environment or area that you live. Protection is about 12 months, likely up to 15. The AHA recommendation guidelines approve that you can vaccinate puppies as soon as eight to nine weeks, and they need a booster two to four weeks later. If they're over that year and a half from their last vaccination, it technically is recommended to then restart a booster series if you live in an endemic region. If they've been exposed to lepto, they kind of vaccinated themselves for a short period of time, but you would want to continue vaccinations. And using a trivalent or quadrivalent vaccine is recommended. So in general, leptospirosis is a pre prevalent and often treatable disease. Due to the zoonosis, it's very important to identify a lepto suspect and early implement both testing, treatment, and precautions for all around. And rapid in-hospital diagnostic tests may be becoming a newer wave of a more sensitive early diagnosis to making sure we're being inclusive for our lepto suspect patients. And with that, I will conclude and take any questions. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Dr. Armentano. If you want to uh, stop staring, sharing your screen, then we can go through some questions that we've had come in. That was really, really interesting, very, very helpful. Um, I really enjoyed it and I'm sure everyone else did as well. Thank you so much. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in uh, that I hope we can have time to discuss. Um, as I mentioned uh, before we started, for anyone that has sent questions in that aren't answered right now, they will be noted and they will be sent along with the recording of today's webinar. So don't panic if the question isn't answered at the moment. Okay, our first question is, how often do you see the peripheral nervous system clinically affected? Is it possible that it be the only response for severe myositis in a dog? So um, in regards to that, I have actually only diagnosed one dog with an only neurologic manifestation of leptospirosis, but it definitely can happen. So there is the vasculitis associated with the disease. So if that affects the neurologic system, that can certainly occur. It's, as you had noted through the talk, is not even on my unusual cases. It's the unusual of the unusual, but it is a thing. And it, it could be seen with more particular serovars, at least in our endemic region, it's not seen as frequently. Okay, great, thank you. Um, question two, is it possible to mix samples of urine and blood to cover a longer period of sensitivity? Yes, absolutely. So it does depend on which diagnostic lab you are sending to. So our diagnostic lab, for example, is validated for urine. They're not validated to do blood PCR testing. If so, it is actually a thing you have to ask. For PC run samples, at least, you can mix the two together, which is amazing, right? Because then you can do one test and include both. But in regards to send out tests, you have to make sure your lab is validated for that assay. Great, super helpful, thank you. Question three, would you test for lepto in a clinically stable dog with PD slash PU without azotemia? Yeah, interestingly, this actually happened to my own dog. Um, so in those patients, so right, if they are especially a vaccinated or if they have mounted some immune response to it, they are not necessarily going to become azotemic. They're that case where they're 50% or you know, two thirds of their GFR is affected. They're not azotemic yet, but they're just PUPD. So it is a part of my standard workup in patients that present with just PUPD, even if they're not otherwise acting ill, because I have definitely gotten, had some positives. Yeah, interesting. Crazy that happened to your own dog as well. Yeah. Question four, how many of your patients with AKI due to lepto need dialysis plus minus TPE? So interestingly, hopefully it's low. So if we get an early diagnosis, we're hoping that 
are aggressive IV fluid therapy, supportive medications, and antibiotics. So I would say 90% of them do not need renal replacement therapy. Very interestingly, and could be a whole talk itself, in the last year, in at least the region that I live, we've been seeing a lot of puppies getting leptospirosis, and they're coming in like they're not even sick. They're coming in suddenly ill and become anuric within hours. So those have been our biggest candidates that have been needed uh, renal replacement therapy right out of the immediate treatment. Okay. Great. Question five. You mentioned blood sample testing is best within 10 days of infection and best at day five. Does this include the incubation period before clinical symptoms? Yep. So the they're normally, once they're infected, it's normally within their blood pretty quickly. And so a lot of times that's why we have that lag of most of the time, by the time that's including when they got the organism into their system. So by the time they're presenting to a veterinarian, that blood may be negative, which is why a lot of veterinary diagnostic labs prefer to just do urine because it's thought to be a higher diagnostic yield. Interestingly, in our PC run samples, as I man uh, mentioned earlier, we're actually starting to maybe see the opposite is that they may be lagging in the blood more because that has been a helpful diagnostic for us. Great. Okay, and we do have time for one more question. So this will be the last question. Is the treatment only for dogs or can it be used for cats as well? So again, we normally leptospirosis is fairly resistant in cats, meaning their bodies just tend to not get the organisms. Um, in a longer presentation, I have the statistic out there is about, of especially a feral cat population, about 5% of cats will be, have positive MAT titers. But absolutely, if you have a region where you may have more leptospirosis, they have outdoor exposure, most of those kitties are hunters. So if they have ingested rodents, they can be positive. You can test them. They can respond to treatment. Right. Okay, that's all that we have time for this evening. Thank you again so much, Dr. Armentano. That was, uh, that was really, really helpful. Fantastic presentation. Thank you very much to Biogal for, for putting this on today. Uh, and thank you to everyone that's joined in. It's been great to have everyone taking part and on the chat, sending questions. There will be a recording sent to everybody that signed up along with the answers to all the questions that were sent. So we thank you very much. We all wish you all a great rest of the week and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.